Welcome to our latest tutorial where we dive into the world of online trading by leveraging the powerful features of the OANDA trading platform. If you've ever been curious about algorithmic trading or want to expand your programming skills into the financial domain, you're in the right place. The recent videos have focused on obtaining data from OANDA's API endpoints. I've decided to spend some time making a couple of videos that demonstrate how to utilize these endpoints. Our goal over the next couple videos will be to create an order book bot. This bot will create support and resistance lines based on order book data. Here's what we'll be covering in today's video. Connecting to OANDA's account endpoint, we'll start by establishing a connection to OANDA's API, ensuring you have the access needed to pull data directly from your account. Exploring and processing the data. Once connected, we'll explore the different types of data available to us. I'll show you how to navigate through the information to find what's most relevant to your trading needs. Creating functions for flexibility. I'll guide you through writing a couple of key functions. The first will return all tradable instrument types, like currencies, CFDs, and metals. The second will allow you to fetch all symbols for a specified type, making it easier to target your trades. And the best part? We'll be doing all of this live in a Jupyter Notebook. This means you'll get to see each step in action, from writing the code to executing it and seeing the real-time results. So, whether you're a seasoned trader looking to automate your strategies, or a developer eager to apply your skills in a new domain, this tutorial is designed to give you a solid foundation. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you won't miss any of our future tutorials. Ready to get started? Let's dive in and unlock the potential of automated trading with OANDA. In this Jupyter Notebook, we will begin by connecting to the OANDA account endpoint. I have already discussed these endpoints in great detail in the previous videos, so this will serve as a brief review. Next, we will delve into exploring and processing the data to understand the resources available to us. The final two sections will focus on creating functions, one to identify all unique types under which we can categorize our assets and another to retrieve all symbols for a specified asset type. We start by importing necessary libraries. Import OS. This line imports the OS library, which provides a way of using operating system dependent functionality. Here, it's used to access environment variables. Import requests. This imports the requests library, which is a popular Python library for making HTTP requests. It's used here to send a GET request to the OANDA API. Import JSON. This imports the JSON library, which is used to work with JSON data. JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, is a lightweight data interchange format that's easy for humans to read and write, and easy for machines to parse and generate. Account ID. This line sets up a variable account ID with a string value that represents the v20 account ID provided by OANDA for API access. API token. Here, the script tries to fetch the value of an environment variable named OANDA API token. Environment variables are used to keep sensitive data, like API tokens, out of your source code. If OANDA API token is not set in the environment, API token will be none. If the API token is none, condition checks if the API token variable is none, which would mean the environment variable was not set. If true, it raises a value error indicating that the OANDA API token environment variable needs to be set. This is a safety check to ensure the script does not proceed without authentication information. Base URL. This sets the base URL for the OANDA practice account API. OANDA provides different URLs for live and practice accounts. Tradable Instruments Endpoint This line constructs the endpoint URL for fetching tradable instruments available on the specified account. It uses an F string to insert the account ID dynamically into the URL. URL This variable combines the base URL with the endpoint URL. The headers dictionary is set up with an authorization key and a value that combines the word bearer with the API token. This is a common way to pass API tokens for authentication in HTTP headers. Response. This line sends an HTTP GET request to the URL constructed earlier, with the headers including the authorization token. The response from the API is stored in the response variable. The if response status code equals 200, condition checks if the HTTP status code in the response is 200, which means the request was successful. If successful, we parse the JSON response body and store it in the data variable. Print JSON dumps. This line pretty prints the JSON data with an indent, making it easier to read. If the request was not successful, it prints an error message including the status code. I want to do a quick review of where you can find the base URLs. Head on over to OANDA's developer website and click on the development guide. 
Here you will see the REST APIs. One for a practice account which is the one we are using at the moment and then the other base URL for working with live accounts. Now that we have completed our first section, we can run our script and have a look at the data we get returned. This should only take a few seconds to complete. Upon receiving the response from the API endpoint, we are presented with an extensive list encapsulated within a JSON dictionary. As we meticulously scroll to the beginning of this list, it becomes evident that the volume of data provided is substantial. We can see it gets truncated and when we click on the three dots it provides us the full list in another tab. First up, we can see we have a dictionary returned. The initial key value pair is instruments that have a list of the assets. We have the name field. This is the identifier used in the financial world to represent silver against the US dollar, a popular metal trading pair. The type field specifies the category of this instrument, which is metal. This helps traders and analysts to quickly identify the nature of the asset they are dealing with. Moving on, the display name field gives us the common name of the instrument, simply silver. This is how the instrument is referred to in trading platforms and financial discussions. The pip location is set at minus 4, indicating the decimal place used to measure the smallest change in value for this pair. It's a crucial figure for traders calculating their potential profit or loss. With a display precision of 5, this tells us the level of precision used when the instrument's price is displayed. It means prices are shown to 5 decimal places, allowing for precise valuation. Trade units precision, at 0, signifies that trades can be made in whole units without fractions, simplifying the trading process for this metal. The minimum trade size is 1, indicating the smallest quantity of this instrument that can be traded. This is great for investors of all sizes, allowing entry at a minimal investment level. Now, the maximum trailing stop distance and minimum trailing stop distance are particularly interesting. Set at 1.00000 and 0 0.00050 respectively, they define the range within which traders can set their trailing stops to manage risk. The maximum position size and maximum order units are set to 0 and 500,000, guiding traders on the maximum limits for holding and ordering this instrument. Margin rate is at 0 0.215. This percentage represents the amount of collateral required to open and maintain a position, a key figure for understanding leverage and risk. The guaranteed stop-loss order mode being disabled informs traders that this risk management feature is not available for this instrument, signaling the need for careful risk assessment. Additionally, the tags section categorizes the instrument further into asset underscore class, kit underscore asset underscore class, and brain underscore asset underscore class, all underlining its commodity and metal classification. Lastly, the financing details like long rate, short rate, and financing days of week shed light on the costs associated with holding positions overnight, critical for calculating trading costs and strategy planning. Now that we've successfully established a connection to OANDA's account endpoint and have thoroughly explored and processed the return JSON data, it's time to move on to the next step. Our objective now is to develop a few helper functions. The first of these functions will be designed to identify and return all unique transaction types available for our account. Let's dive in and start crafting these functions. First, we define a function called getUniqueTypes. This function is like a mini program that we can use repeatedly. It's designed to take one input, which we're calling data. This data is expected to be a list where each item in the list is a dictionary representing an instrument, and each dictionary contains various details about the instrument, including its type. Inside the function, we create something called a set named unique types. A set is a collection where each item is unique, meaning no duplicates are allowed. This characteristic makes sets perfect for our task because we're interested in finding all the unique instrument types. Next, we start a loop that goes through each item, instrument, in the data list. Each item is expected to be a dictionary. For every instrument, each item in our loop, we check if it has a type key. We're looking for a specific piece of information labeled type inside each dictionary. If type exists, we add its value to our unique type set. Since sets only keep unique items, even if we add the same type multiple times, it will only be stored once. After we've checked every instrument in the list, we convert our unique type set into a list. We do this because lists are more commonly used and understood, and they're easier to display or work with for most purposes. The function ends by returning this list. To use our function, we call it and pass it the instrument's data. 
This data should be a list of dictionaries, with each dictionary representing an instrument. We store the result in a variable called instrument types. Finally, we display the list of unique instrument types we found. This is done using a display function, which shows us the unique types extracted by our getUniqueTypes function. OK, with the function written, let's put it to the test and see what unique types we get back. Great, it worked. We got back what we expected a list containing unique types. Now let's create a function that groups our tradable assets into these types. We start by defining the function using def is a keyword that starts the definition of a function in Python. A function is a reusable piece of code designed to perform a specific task. Filter assets by type is the name of the function we're defining. It's a name we choose, ideally descriptive of what the function does. Inside the parentheses, data, and asset type are parameters. These are inputs the function needs to do its job. Data is expected to be a list of dictionaries where each dictionary represents an asset. Asset type is a string that specifies the type of assets we're interested in filtering. This line initializes an empty dictionary named result. Dictionaries in Python are collections of key-value pairs. This result dictionary will store our filtered assets. This line starts a loop that will go through each item in the data list. Item represents the current element in the loop, and data is the list of all assets we're filtering through. Here, we check if the current item's type matches the asset type we're looking for. Item.getType gets the value associated with the key type in the current item. If the item doesn't have a type key, get returns none instead of causing an error. The equals checks for equality between the item's type and the asset type we provided. If the item's type matches the asset type, we extract its name using item.getName and store it in asset name. This name will be used as a key in our result dictionary. This line creates a new dictionary, asset info. This dictionary is filled with key value pairs from the current item being processed in the loop, with one important condition. It excludes the pair's name. Item.items is a method that retrieves all the key value pairs from item as a list of tuples. Each tuple contains two elements, the key, k, and the value, v, of one pair in the dictionary. k, v for k, v in item.items. If k does not equal name, is a dictionary comprehension, which is a compact way to construct a new dictionary. This specific comprehension iterates over all key value pairs returned by item.items. For each key value pair, if k does not equal name, checks whether the key, k, is not equal to the string name. If this condition is true, meaning the key is anything other than name, the key value pair is included in the new asset info dictionary. If the condition is false, the key is name, the key value pair is excluded from asset info. In simpler terms, this line of code copies every detail from the current asset into a new dictionary, except for the asset's name. This is done to avoid redundancy since the asset's name is already used as a key in the result dictionary, and we don't need to include it again within the details. Next, we add the asset info dictionary to our result dictionary with asset name as the key. This means we're building up a dictionary where each key is the name of an asset, and the value is another dictionary with details about that asset. Finally, after the loop has processed all items in data, we return the result dictionary. This dictionary now contains only the assets of the specified type, with their names as keys and their details as values, minus the name. Wow, great job that was a lot. Let's test this new function out by splitting all assets into their types. These lines show how to use the filter assets by type function. We call the function with instruments, a list of asset dictionaries, and a string representing the type of assets we're interested in, currency, metal, or CFD. The function returns a dictionary of assets of that type, which we store in a variable, currency pairs, metal pairs, CFD pairs. Let's explore what our function has done for us now. We'll start by having a look at the length of each dictionary. We can see that we have 68 assets in the currency pairs dictionary, 21 assets in the metal dictionary, and 34 assets in the CFD dictionary. Now let's look at the keys for each dictionary of assets. Sorry for the slow typing. I should have sped this up. Now, we are going to explore and display the dictionary keys. The display function is commonly used in interactive environments like Jupyter Notebooks to output the content in a more readable or formatted manner than a standard print statement. 
The dot keys method returns a view object that displays a list of all the keys in the dictionary. Let's have a look at what we have in our currency pairs dictionary. Since I type so slowly, I'll start a little music for entertainment. Here we create a list from our currency pairs dictionary so we can iterate through it and have a look at the stored values. Our for loop is nothing new now. We employ a for loop to traverse the list of currency pair keys. This approach enables the sequential display of each currency pair's value corresponding to the iterated key. Let's have some fun now and create a slide show viewing each key value pair, one at a time. In order to create our slide show we need to import a couple new libraries. The first being the ipython.display module is part of the ipython ecosystem, which provides rich interactive computing and visualization capabilities, especially within Jupyter Notebooks. This module is specifically designed to facilitate the display of various types of content in a rich format. Key functionalities include the display function allows for the display of Python objects in rich media formats such as images, videos, HTML, and more. It is highly versatile, supporting a wide range of output types which makes it essential for interactive data analysis and visualization tasks in Jupyter Notebooks. The time function is very basic and we will simply use the sleep method so we have time to view the output before moving to the next slide. The clear underscore output function provides a way to clear the output of a Jupyter Notebook cell dynamically. This is particularly useful in interactive environments where you want to update or replace the content displayed to the user without accumulating previous outputs. The wait parameter can be set to true to delay clearing the output until new output is available to display, which helps in creating smoother transitions and updates. Let's have a look at our slideshow in action. And that wraps up our tutorial on fetching tradable instruments using the OANDA API. I hope you found this guide informative and that it empowers you to start integrating financial data into your own projects with ease. Your support and engagement mean the world to us, and we're thrilled to have you on this journey towards mastering finance coding. Before we sign off, I want to give you a sneak peek into what's coming next. In our upcoming video, we're taking things a notch higher. Imagine not only retrieving financial data but also visualizing it in a way that's both insightful and interactive. Yes, you guessed it, we're diving into the world of candlestick data. We'll explore how to get candlestick data from the OANDA API and then, step by step, I'll show you how to display this data in an interactive chart. This is going to be a game changer for those of you interested in market trends, trading strategies, or simply love the beauty of data visualization. So, if you're curious about how to bring financial data to life and make your analyses more dynamic, you won't want to miss our next tutorial. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified as soon as it's live. Your feedback and questions are what shape our content, so please, drop a comment below about what you're most excited to learn next or any challenges you'd like us to tackle. Thank you once again for watching, and a huge thank you for your continued support. Until next time, keep coding, keep exploring, and keep pushing the boundaries of what you can achieve with financial programming. See you in the next video?